When was the Great Fire of London? When was the Battle of Hastings? And what happened at Amritsar? Now, I want you to think about that. If you knew the answers, the first three questions we asked, and not the fourth, like us three, what happened at Amritsar is one of the greatest atrocities of the British Empire, 13th of April 1919, and it's when British imperialist forces killed over a thousand people at a peaceful protest and religious celebration in Amritsar, Punjab, India. So clearly there are some huge gaps in our knowledge of the British Empire. The message of our talk today is simple, to be able to recognise the legacies of British imperialism. Jeremy Corbyn recently reiterated the importance of providing an honest curriculum when it comes to recounting the atrocities committed uh, in the name of imperial expansion. We are committed to this mission, but we are not going to be recounting or paraphrasing these goals today. This is critical, but it's not the only issue, and rather we want to offer our own experiences or our own thoughts on what the legacy of the British imperialism or the British Empire is. So the holes in British popular knowledge and memory of our empire are highlighted by a common question, one that I and other non-white Britons are all too familiar with. Where are you from? Now, for me, this question raises two problems. The first is in the assumptions of the questioner. Although myself and my parents were born in England, I quickly learned that responding with Kingston upon Thames was not the desired response. That answer was followed by, no, but where are you really from? Uh, but where are you from from? Finally, a sigh of relief would be drawn, not when they learnt of my dad's English and Irish heritage, but when I told them that my mum's family was from the Caribbean. The tone, frequency and random context within which I am asked this question implies more than a genuine intrigue of my heritage. Indeed, second and third generation white European immigrants rarely have the same experience. Instead, it represents an attempt to place me within a worldview that says that my blackness makes me less British, other. And they were not the only ones that held this assumption. The second issue lies in the extreme discomfort I felt when asked this question. This was partly because I was being othered, but that sense of othering was confounded by my own ingrained belief that my skin colour and the British identity I held for myself did not align. Now, although I am forced to constantly ask where I am from, that I am repeatedly asked this question implies I am not the only one that is not sure. This idea that ethnic minorities are outsiders to Britain is false. The truth is in our history. In the last 10 to 20 years, historians have demonstrated the interconnected nature of our colonies and British economy, society, politics, and identity. So heritage and identity are understood to be very personal. But in many situations, there is a broader context that we, and by we I mean people who aren't necessarily ethnically English, in, a way, in the way that we relate to being in Britain. This is where our connect, collective knowledge tends to falter. In the 1700s, there was a flourishing black British community in Liverpool due to traders and seamen that were involved in the slave trade settling there. Employment through the East India Company brought a lot of Indians to the UK in the 18th, in the 18th century. And throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, colonial subjects, many of them fought for Britain, um, and they also settled here. So ethnic diversity in the UK stretches back centuries, but we are still so uncomfortable or find it really difficult to, implicate, to incorporate the other into our story. And then we look at our culture and it's so diverse. We're obsessed with tea. Curry is one of our national dishes. Our love for sugar stretches back to the 18th century. The legacy of imperialism is still evident in our literature. One of the greatest works of our canon, Jane Eyre by Bronte, features the Creole Bertha Mason. 
In our economy, the legacy is still evident with Catherine Hall's ongoing work charting the commercial legacy of the 20 million pounds paid out in compensation to slave owners. And then most obviously, the diversity of our population, with 25% of school-aged children hailing from minority backgrounds. So modern Britain is indisputably shaped by the empire, and colonial expansion is the precursor to globalization. I was born in London, and I've lived there my whole life. I'm mixed race. I'm born to a Nigerian father and an Italian mother. And there are intricacies to both of their identities, with my father hailing from the would-be Biafra and my mother from the annexed South Tyrol, let alone my own identity. However, when I'm asked that question, where are you from, I know that people aren't waiting to hear I'm from London or to hear that I'm British. They are referring to my visible, visible African heritage. So there is this reluctance or inability to consider people of black or minority ethnic backgrounds British full stop without the need to delve into their deeper ancestry. So what does it mean to be British? Well, I consider myself British, I am British, and it means various things to me and they conflict each other sometimes. It means being comfortable in a group of ethnically diverse people, my friends, my family. It means being distinctly uncomfortable when I go to some parts of this country because of the color of my skin. It means not feeling completely comfortable wearing my hair in its natural state because it's an afro is a cool hairstyle rather than conforming to the beauty standard that is long, straight hair. It means taking advantage of the higher education system that is world class here, but that I know to be built upon the struggles and oppression of my ancestors. It also means living in a largely prosperous and functioning society, and it means being proud of London, which is a diverse place. So it's a complex identity, and it's composed of both belonging and difference. Britain spent centuries spreading across the globe. Some 458 million people were ruled by this tiny island. And to justify colonial expansion, there had to be this narrative of otherness and difference. Now, having built itself upon worldwide, worldwide exploitation, in the wake of mass migration and EU skepticism, the UK now wants to revert to its small island status. The thing is, though, the Britain that people from the BNP, the EDL, Britain First dream of, is a Britain that ceased to exist centuries ago when Britain implicated itself in the histories and societies from all over the world. Multiculturalism is a real, and in my opinion, positive consequence of imperialism. And now the histories, histories cannot be separated. Maybe not all are adequately represented, and I think specifically of one single month that is dedicated to the study of black history, but they all exist. And we are all implicated because we, well, a lot of us, benefit from the wrongdoings of this country. And we need to, in looking at the global climate, look beyond the surface and realize that we are part of many of the issues across the world today, including Syria, for example. If we don't do this, we risk the legacy of Britain being a legacy of denial. And beyond economy, identities, and culture, this implication rings true to contemporary politics. Yes, so as you can see from the slide, I study Spanish and Arabic, and I spent my year abroad living in Beirut, Lebanon. I'm not giving you a history or politics lecture today. I just wanted to recount the experience that I had as a British person, not only being in Lebanon, but being educated in Lebanon. So. I went to a very good Arabic school, had a full-bodied education, not only in the language, but in its literature, the media of the Arab world, and contemporary history. Every week, we'd have another contemporary history lesson, and another passage would be presented to us on a modern Arab nation state and its recent history. And Britain is mentioned time and time again. And I would often be singled out in the class because I was the only British person in that class. And my Arabic teacher would wag a reproachful finger and say, Ya Sufia, as if to say, Oh, the Brits are at it again. They've taken over another country. They've stuck their nose in again where we didn't want them to. And they've damaged the place irreparably. 
And in case you didn't know, it still hasn't been a century since the principal ruler of Muslims in the world it has not been a sheikh, it wasn't Ayatollah, it was our very own George V. Now, why didn't I know about British imperial involvement in the Middle East? I'm not an, well, I wouldn't describe myself as an ill-informed person. I'm a voracious reader, I l and I loved history at school. I know all about what the Romans did for us. I know about Anglo-Saxon mud hut, Harold Hadrada, Cavaliers, Roundheads, and all these things, but I didn't know about British imperialism. So I'm in Lebanon, and what do I learn about? If you take one thing from this evening, please let it be the year 1916 and the Sykes-Picot Agreement. The Sykes-Picot Agreement was between George Sykes and, um, no, that's not right, Mark Sykes and François Georges Picot, two diplomats, one British, one French. What did they do? They carved up the spoils of the Ottoman Empire. They carved up the Ottoman Arab provinces, shared them between the two, redrew their borders, gave them nice, swanky new names. We now had a Lebanon, we now had a Syria for the French. We had Transjordan, Palestine, and Iraq. Now, this completely went against what T. Lawrence, or as we might know him today, Lawrence of Arabia, had promised the Arabs. The Arabs had sided with us against the Ottomans in the First World War. They did that because the British Empire had promised them an independent Arab nation state in Greater Syria. And that did not happen. Instead, we conquered them again. Um, and what happens when you break a promise? You cause distrust, you cause problems. That is why we have a never-ending list of conflicts in the Middle East today because of the Sykes-Picot agree Agreement. What about the Balfour Declaration that came three weeks before the Sykes-Picot Agreement, which promised Jews a homeland in Palestine? I needn't tell you what's happened there. Lebanon had a civil war. It's just been one catastrophe after another catastrophe. But there was no reason why I shouldn't have known the word Sykes-Picot before I went to Lebanon. There is no good reason now why I should know it, simply because I'm interested in the Middle East and the Arabic language. It's something we should all be taught about at school, because our news feeds are governed by so much misinformation on the Middle East. <sighs> the Middle East is always framed as this alien, disconnected other with strange problems that are now affecting us. That is not the case. Because of our imperial interests, our fates are inextricably intertwined, and they will be for the rest of all our lives. Our problems are theirs, their problems are ours, and it's a conversation we need to be, happen we need to be having when the Middle East is filling our politics and news every day in the age of terror. So Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, leader of ISIS, said that ISIS won't stop in their advancement until they hit the last nail in the coffin of the Sykes-Picot conspiracy. Those two words, Sykes-Picot, which I had never heard of before I went to Lebanon, not only are they being used today by people halfway across the world, they are still filling people with antagonism. They are still affecting the lives of people and threatening global security today. I, as a 21-year-old British girl interested in the Arab world, went to Lebanon and I was embarrassed to be in that class and not know about our imperial past. That's not right. I shouldn't be ashamed for being British. The empire did some good. It also did some bad and some ugly. We need to have a conversation about it. We need to keep talking about it. And if you, like me, didn't have the chance to learn it at school because the British curriculum doesn't include it, make an effort now, read about it. Because we can't be ashamed of being British. How can we go on the global stage like I went to Lebanon and still be embarrassed? We can't keep having these skeletons in our closet. So what is in our British curriculum? 
I remember being taught directly about the British Empire once. I was seven, and the lesson was on the transatlantic slave trade. Now, the teacher held up an image of a black man with whip marks in his back and told me about the victims of Africa who were sold into slavery by Europeans, who incidentally then freed them. The image I was left of my ancestors was one of distant victims, and though I hate to admit it, I was embarrassed of my heritage. And sadly, the new history curriculum implemented by Michael Gove in 2013 would not have prevented this embarrassment. Non white people scarcely appear in the British context, and when they do, it's as immigrants after World War II, implying they had no relevance to British history before then. But Within studying history, there is hope. An embarrassment of my heritage no longer affects me, and somewhat ironically, this shift came while studying history at university. I was encouraged to raise questions about the past, and among other things, I learned about the ingenuity of slave culture. They, they interacted with the mainstream to create music, a dialect, and even forms of Christianity that exist today. But what about our schools now? Well, Teaching this needn't, in, needn't bring a full redraft of the school curriculum. It can be brought into what's already there. Lessons on the two world wars can incorporate the countless men and women from across the empire who raised money, provided services, and fought on the front line of the world wars. It would be wrong to argue that white and non-white Britons have the same fundamental history. But British history contains both of these stories, intertwined and inextricable. To ignore that is to ignore a huge part of who we all are and where we all came from. We just want to finish with a quote from one of the great thinkers of our time, Frankie Boyle, which sums up our ideas from today. Yes, Britain is a beautiful place to live, and we are lucky to be born here because of other people's oil, other people's sugar, other people's tea, other people's money. You weren't born in a country. You were born in a getaway car. And the victims have been chasing you down ever since by boat, by lorry, and on foot. Thank you very much. <laughs>